today on Living Power. Jesus' point is that because of our sin, we all owe God an unpayable moral and spiritual debt. We can't pay it back. There's no way that we could pay back that debt. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. I trust you in times like this. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe, uh, surround us with your presence, and Lord, you take care of us. Take care of us and our loved ones and our families and our friends, and uh, you be glorified in and through our lives. Now give us insight to your word uh, and help us to understand how to take this principle and apply it in our life. I pray, pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Scientists have observed um, a conciliatory behavior in many different animal species. Um, gorillas, goats, hyenas, dogs. Uh, they, they, will, they will get right with each other. If they fight, uh, they will come back and make up. They do that. Uh, animals will often demonstrate a contrite and friendly behavior after a confrontation. Uh, the, there is only one species that so far has failed to show any signs of reconciliation after a, a fight, after a confrontation. A cat. <laughs> a domestic cat at that. Apparently, cats never forgive. Uh, that's the only, thing, the only conclusion we can draw from that. Um, and so, when it comes to forgiving others... Don't act like a cat. That's basically the lesson for today. Uh, today we look at the second part of our study of uh, kingdom forgiveness. And in this 18th chapter of Matthew, Jesus addresses what the kingdom of God is all about. And that he's been dealing with it about the faith of the kingdom, and he's been dealing about the fellowship of the kingdom. And today, uh, last Sunday and today, we're looking at forgiveness, kingdom forgiveness, so let's look at this passage, Matthew 18, starting with verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When, the, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. We aren't exactly wired for forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't come real easy for, for many of us. Um, if we've been hurt, if we've been insulted, uh, it's real easy for us to bear a grudge. We want retaliation. We want to get back. We want revenge. And we want that person who did whatever it was to us to know that they hurt us, and we want them to suffer for it. Even if it's just a little bit, we want retaliation. That's kind of our nature. That's kind of a, it's a sinful nature, but that's part of our nature. We want people to get what they deserve, and we don't forget. I read about a guy who uh, was, uh, works as an umpire uh, in a summer league out in, in uh, Colorado, and uh, over the winter he was pulled over by a police officer uh, for going too fast in the snow. And uh, they do that in Colorado. And he tried to talk the police officer out of, out of getting a ticket, and the police officer just said, look, if you don't like it, just you know, deal with it in court. And so the guy had to deal with it and, and go to court. 
The next summer, uh, in the first game of the season, uh, he was umpiring that game, and the first batter up was the policeman. And they recognized each other. And the officer stepped into the batter's box and he said, uh, so ump, uh, how'd things with the ticket go? And uh, the umpire looked at the officer and he said, you'd better swing at everything. <laughs> we aren't exactly wired for forgiveness. It just doesn't come easy for us. Forgiveness is the result of two of God's characteristics. This is really important to understand. There can't be real forgiveness, true forgiveness, unless these two elements are real in our life, and that is God's grace and God's mercy. Mercy and grace have to exist in our lives and have to be evident in our life for there to be forgiveness. And let's look at those two things, and let me define them. Mercy is the virtue of goodwill. It's the virtue of goodwill. It is not receiving something that, uh, that we deserve, uh, like a police officer giving, <laughs> letting you go by not giving you a ticket. That's mercy. It's the character of God. It's a virtue of God's goodwill. The second thing is grace. Grace is divine influence reflected in one's life. Real grace, true grace, is, is, uh, comes from God and is effected by God in our lives. So grace is the uh, influence, divine influence, and it reflected in one's life. Uh, we often will also say grace is, mercy is not getting what you deserve, grace is getting something you don't deserve. Uh, and there's certainly some truth to that. Now, in this passage today, Jesus makes it clear that our forgiveness of others should be proportionate to the amount of forgiveness that we have received. Our our forgiveness of others should be proportionate to the amount of forgiveness we have received. The servant had been forgiven all, and in turn, he should have forgiven all of the person that owed him money. A child of God has had all of his sins forgiven by God. God has forgiven your sin, all of your sin. He has forgiven your sin. Therefore, when someone sins against us, we should be willing to forgive all. We are to forgive in proportion to what we have received. But in order for, uh, for us to offer another person the gift of mercy and grace, or the gift of forgiveness, uh, you have to see them as you see yourself. You have to understand that. We looked at this a little bit last Sunday. When you understand that God died, Jesus died for that person's sin against you, then you begin to understand that you can, under, you can forgive them. Because God died for them in the same way that he died for you. He died because of their sin, and if their sin was against you, it's still sin, and he died for that. And so you can forgive him. If God's willing to forgive him, then you can learn to forgive and let God forgive through you. If you don't see yourself as flawed and fallen, uh, desperately needing God's mercy and grace, then you will not offer mercy and grace to a fellow human being. You just won't do it. If you understand that you are a flawed person, fallen from, from, uh, from, 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 your, from God's grace, not that you've lost your salvation, but that you have fallen, you've sinned, and that you have to receive forgiveness for that. When you understand that that grace and mercy comes from God, then, only then, will you be able to offer mercy and grace to a, another human being who is also flawed and fallen and desperately needing mercy and grace in their life. So mercy and grace come from God. This is really important to understand. Mercy and grace come from God. I cannot share true mercy and grace if I have not received true mercy and grace. You can't act merciful. You can act merciful, but you can't have true mercy if you have not received true mercy in your life. You cannot display true grace if you have not received true grace in your life. I can only offer pity or patience or willfully ignore someone's behavior. I can do that on my own, but that's not mercy. Don't confuse mercy with pity, or with patience, or with just ignoring the way somebody behaves. That's not mercy. Uh, mercy remember, mercy is the virtue of goodwill. It's, it's a character, it's a nature of God. I can behave kindly and generous, I can be intentionally nice to someone who has offended me, but that's not grace. That's just acting out 
a characteristic of some sort. True mercy and true grace come from God. They are God's attributes. They're part of his character. And the only way that I can dispense true mercy and grace is for God to dispense his mercy and grace through me. Look at what the scripture says about where mercy comes from. Psalm 119, 77. Let your mercy come to me that I may live. In other words, it has to come from God. Mercy comes from God. It's a character of God. Daniel 9, 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. That is something that is, that is godly. And for it to work in your life, or, or through your life, it has to be God at work in your life. You cannot forgive unless God is forgiving in you. You cannot be merciful unless God is being merciful through you. You can act things out, but true mercy is from God. Uh, grace, the Bible says the grace also comes from God. John 1.16, for from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Grace comes from God. 1 Corinthians 1.4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Grace is something that comes from God. And so that has to work in our lives in order to work through our lives. So how does that happen? Well, let's look at how this mercy and grace flows through us. Think of mercy and grace as, as a river, if you will, that flows from God. We either receive it and it impacts our life, or we reject it, which also impacts our life only in a negative way. But it flows from God, and it is to flow through me. And because it's flowing from God, it's going to impact my life. It's going to make a difference in my life. And if it makes a difference in my life, then it's going to make a difference in how I react to other people. And that mercy and grace flows through me into their life, and it impacts them. God's kingdom is grounded in his mercy and grace. That's what Jesus is teaching, that God's kingdom is grounded. The foundation of God's kingdom is his mercy and grace. The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed some money. That's the story that Jesus is telling them. And in the process, one of his debtors owes him millions of dollars, millions, of, you know, a, 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 a 10,000 talents is multi-millions of dollars. But the man fell down and begged, and he says, please be patient, I'll pay it all. The master's filled with pity, and he releases him, and he forgives his debt. Now, in Jesus' stories, uh, the characters often represent God and people. And this is a, a classic example of that. The king, uh, or the master, uh, represents God, and the people represent us. And we're represented by the servant who owes 10,000 talents. Now, the talent is an incredible measure of, of wealth. Many historians believe that in uh, Jesus' time that the Roman Empire, uh, the wealth of the Roman Empire uh, never exceeded 5,000 talents. So that's all, I mean, that's how, that's how much money we're talking about. 5,000 talents represented the entire Roman government in Jesus' time. That's how wealthy, and it was a very wealthy uh, uh, government. Um, but, this is an, but what Jesus is talking about is this unthinkable number. What he's saying is 10,000 talents. That's like the national debt. And really, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's unthinkable. Or maybe your mortgage. It's about like that, maybe. Uh, it's just an unthinkable amount of money. Uh, and so, so when Jesus says 10,000 talents, the disciples had to go, whoa. <laughs> you know, that's just an impossible amount. There's no way anybody could have owed 10,000 talents. So when Jesus says he owes 10,000 talents, what he's talking about is that it is an unpayable amount. There's no way this man would ever be able to pay it. And so for this, this master to forgive it was unbelievable, that a master would just forgive that national debt. Jesus' point is that because of our sin, we all owe God an unpayable moral and spiritual debt. We can't pay it back. There's no way that we could pay back that debt. And God loves us so much, and because he knows there's no way that we could ever get out of our moral and spiritual debt on our own, he canceled our debt on the cross. That 10,000 talents was forgiven by grace and mercy. That's what Jesus is teaching here. There's no way you could pay your debt. No way. No way you could pay the debt of your sin. You could not earn enough to pay your way out of that. It is an unpayable debt. 
But the master, God, forgave that debt. He forgave you of that debt. And so uh, that, that kingdom of God is based on his mercy and grace. If it did not exist, if God's mercy and grace did not exist, we'd be dead. We would never be able to, to get out of our sin debt. We'd never, we would all be bound for hell. But here's the second part of that. Mercy and grace is dependent on what we receive. Our mercy and grace is dependent on what we receive and understand that we've received. I can be merciful and gracious or graceful. can't be graceful, but I can be gracious. I can be mercy. I can provide mercy and grace to someone because of what I have received. Not because I'm just such a nice guy, but because we have such a great God. When we fail to extend forgiveness to others, we have never truly experienced or accepted God's mercy and grace, God's forgiveness for ourselves. Can't do it. Can't do it. The servant received pure grace, pure mercy, and he owed his life, his freedom, his, his family, his possessions, and everything that he had, he owed that to the grace and mercy of his master. But the servant went out and found a man who owed him roughly four months' wages. That's all. That, that, that's all. A denarii is basically one day's pay. Uh, a, a, a Roman soldier received one point something denarii a day. And so, so he, he basically owed this guy four months' wages. It's a repayable amount. Yeah, it's a stiff amount, but it's repayable. But he would not allow that. That guy showed no mercy and no grace whatsoever. So even though he was shown mercy and grace, he did not accept the value of that mercy and grace in his life. Therefore, he could not show mercy and grace. So the passage says that that same servant went out right immediately, apparently, right after he was forgiven his, his, his whole debt, which was an amazing thing. And instead of celebrating, he goes out and grabs some guy by the throat and tells him to pay up. And the guy can't pay up, so he throws him in jail. Now, we have a tendency to believe that we can receive forgiveness from God, but not give it to others. And we do that. We withhold forgiveness of others. We've received, we think we've received God's forgiveness, but we withhold our forgiveness of others. That's not really receiving God's forgiveness. It's not receiving God's forgiveness. Because when you receive God's forgiveness, it changes your life. It changes the way you act. It changes the way you react. It changes the way you interact with other people. So if that person had, this guy, had really received the forgiveness that the master gave him, he wouldn't have acted that way. But he did act that way, which tells me that he had not really received the forgiveness. And so... Uh, this happens all the time, even among Christians. We don't forgive. We just hold on to something and say, I, I can't let it go. Or just let it, hold on to it, and then eventually we're just like, okay, let it, we'll let bygones be bygones, and we'll just put it behind us or we'll sweep it under the rug or something. That's not forgiveness. The Journal of Adult Development said 75% of people surveyed believe they have been forgiven by God for their past sins and mistakes and wrongdoings, but only 52%, 75% say they've been forgiven, but only 52% say that they have forgiven others. And even fewer, only 43% say that they have sought forgiveness for a wrong that they did to someone else. Forgiveness doesn't come easy for us. It doesn't come naturally for us. It's not a characteristic that we, that we just have inside of us. It can only come from God because God does a work in our lives and then through our lives. Jesus doesn't call the idea that we think we can get forgiveness from God without giving forgiveness to others a bad idea or insufficient theology or just, you know, spiritual immaturity or weak thinking. He calls it impossible. It can't be done. That's what Jesus says. Unless you've received forgiveness, you really have understood God's forgiveness in your life, you can't forgive. You won't forgive. Forgiveness isn't natural, and that's why it's essential to let God's mercy and grace take root in our lives and in our hearts. So word gets out to the, to the royal court about this servant's bad behavior. 
And eventually, it gets back to the king, to the master. And he calls a servant in and he says, look, you just don't get it, do you? You just don't understand what happened, do you? You thought my mercy and grace meant that I would let you get away with whatever you wanted to, and, uh, and then you could go abuse whomever you wanted to. You thought that I, I had forgiven you and that it was just oh, that it was over and done deal and that you bore no responsibility. And that's exactly the opposite. Because he had been forgiven, he had to be forgiving. That was the, that was the requirement. That was what the king was saying. I taught you to forgive, and what did you do? You did not forgive. So the servant made a huge mistake. The king said, I offered you a huge amount of mercy and grace and forgiveness, but you didn't let it change you. You wanted it for yourself and then selfishly denied it to others. Then this angry king sent the man to prison until he could pay his debt. Now let me ask you a question. How would he be able to pay his debt if he's in prison? Can't be done. Can only be done by the grace and mercy of the king. It's the king's forgiveness that can set him free, not him being able to pay his own debt. There's no way he'd be able to pay that 10,000 10, talents because it was an impossible amount. Yeah? Yes, that's exactly what it means. Yeah, if you haven't received God's mercy and grace, if you haven't received his forgiveness, you're lost. That's, you're lost. I mean, that's just the bottom line. God offers you mercy and grace, but if you don't receive it, if, it doesn't, if you don't welcome it and embrace it and let it change your life, then you haven't received it. So Jesus says, and he, and he starts to wrap this story up, and he says, uh, shouldn't shouldn't you have had mercy on the, the king says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? That is not just a question, that's a statement of responsibility. If you have received mercy, you have the responsibility to give mercy. If you have received grace, you have the responsibility to give grace. It's not something that you have a choice in the matter. You have been given mercy, so you are to act with mercy. You have been given grace, you are to act with grace. That's what the king is saying. That's what God is saying to us. And Jesus is saying, look, the way that this guy acted, the way this guy behaved, that's not how it works in God's kingdom. That's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, you think you can do this, but you can't. If you haven't been changed by God's mercy and grace, you haven't been changed. And the problem is with you, not with what that guy owes you. So understand this key element that forgiveness leads to forgiveness. This is, a, this is a very important principle, and that's what Jesus wraps it up with. He says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Genuine forgiveness. Jesus ends with this story, and he says, look, this is how my heavenly Father is going to treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. If you don't do that, then you haven't learned forgiveness. You haven't discovered what forgiveness is all about. And if you aren't willing to forgive then you haven't received forgiveness. If you aren't willing to forgive, then you haven't received forgiveness. You don't understand what happened. You don't understand what God offered. You haven't received forgiveness. When Beth Moore and her husband uh, spent some time over in Angola, Angola had, was war-torn, and uh, there were tens of thousands of, of people starving over there. And uh, Beth Moore and her husband went over there, and she said they were changed forever from going over there. And she said this, I learned something in one of the rural villages that will mark my teaching and response to the word of God. As we stood, as we stood there trying to absorb the sights and the smells of living death, our guide said, one of the most frustrating things is that in villages where they receive seed, they often eat the seed rather than planting it and bringing forth a harvest. Beth applied that to her understanding of the word of God. And she said, I couldn't get that statement out of my mind. Why do some people see the results of, the God, of God's word and others don't? Why have many of us read books on, forgiven, on forgiveness and on forgiving people and getting right with people? We've known the teachings that were in the Bible. We know the teachings are true, and yet we remain in our bitterness. Why does that happen? Because we ate the seed instead of sowing the seed. 
See, that's what happens to us. That's what happens in our lives. If we can't impart what we have received, then we've eaten the seed. We're not really planting the seed and letting it grow and flourish in our own lives. If you're not acting like Jesus to other people, then you haven't discovered the power of God in your life. If God isn't that real in your life, he's not going to be real through your life. That is the key element in understanding how we're to walk in our circles of influence. This week, as you go to work, as you interact with your family, as you interact with friends, as you, as you connect with people, the people that are in your circle of influence, understand that God has to flow through you. It's that, that flow of mercy and grace that has to work through your life. If you are not Jesus to somebody else this week, then he isn't Jesus to you. It's a tough thing to swallow, isn't it? It's a tough thing to get a hold of. It'd be nice if we could just, oh, let's just be nice and just, you know, we'll love each other and kind of hug each other. But this is not a game. This is not, we're dealing with people's eternity here. We are dealing with people's full eternity here. I uh, had a, a conversation this week with um, um, uh, a guy who, who happens to be gay, and he was talking about um, his belief and the way he thought of himself and so forth and so on. And, and he said, and you're a Christian and you hate gays. And I said, boy, you got a problem there because I'm a Christian and I do love gays. You know, I love you. I don't care about what's between your legs. I care about what's between your ears. You know, I'm concerned about your eternity. I'm not concerned about your sex life. I could care less about that. I let God deal with that. That's not my issue. I don't have the right to, to, to do that. But I do care about you. I do care about you and, 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 and your eternity. That matters to me. That's important to me. And he says, he said, nobody's ever said that to me before. I said, well, you haven't talked to enough real Christians. Because Christians love people. Because God loves us. And he loves through us. And if love is allowing God to do something in somebody else's life, and that's what love is, allowing God to do something in somebody else's life through you, that's love. Then, then we love. It's just that river, that flowing river of mercy and grace through our life. When we understand God loves us, we understand that he loves others through us. When we understand that God was merciful to us, then we understand that he can be merciful to other people through us. When we understand that it was God's grace that gave us life, then we can understand that God can give other people life through his grace, through our life. We live Christ before people. That's our job. That's our calling. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing. 